NHL insider Frank Saravelli of the Frankly Speaking podcast and the Daily Faceoff, the one national guy who told you <laughs> Elias Patterson was signing for eight years while others were sitting there telling you, oh, maybe it'll be four or five. How you doing, Frank? Good to see you. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, what's going on? Well, opening day. Got your Phillies sweater on. At least got to wait till tomorrow. We were rained out today. Yeah. But yeah. It'll, uh, it'll be good. Looking forward to baseball season. Yeah. Ditto. Uh, Elias Lynn home. Missed the game on Monday. Did not practice on Wednesday. Uh, Rick Tockett has called it a nagging injury, Frank, but how concerned should the Canucks be here that their prime deadline acquisition, albeit six weeks before the deadline, may be compromised in the playoffs? And, of course, has to think about his pending unrestricted free agency. Yeah, I've heard that part of it be a talking point. I don't really put much stock and or faith in that because the best way to increase your value is to play. You've already, you know, this year with the drop in point production, there's already been some damage done. It's not going to be any worse than it is right now. The best thing you can do for yourself if you're Lindholm is come back and have a tremendous playoff. So I I think the motivation is clear on his end, what the best thing to do is for me. um, I think there certainly is some, there has to be some concern from the Canucks end that you at least allow yourself the proper runway for this to get right. I don't know all the details. In fact, I don't know many details at all when it comes to Lindholm's injury, aside from some of the speculation that's been out there. The Canucks have been incredibly tight-lipped about it. What I would say is that if it really is a nagging thing, hold him out as long as necessary to get as close to, you know, right as possible to give your team every opportunity when it matters most timeline wise these last 10 games i mean you've got a healthy enough lead over the oilers you know demko is i think going to get enough time to get himself set and get into at least a little bit of a rhythm before the postseason and just give lindholm whatever time necessary that's how i would look at it Yeah, when you look at the Lindholm situation, Frank, you mentioned obviously that's got to be in the back of his mind and his camp's mind of of not being able to go out there and put up points during the regular season. But it is the playoffs, and that's the reason why they brought him here. How much is his value, do you think? You just mentioned as well that, you know, it's obviously the down year. How much do you think it's gone down as opposed to, you know, what it was when it was an all-time high with Calgary? Yeah, I think a pretty significant amount. I would say that... There was a lot of talk in the tail end of, you know, going into this last season in Calgary of, hey, he wants nine million bucks a year. And, you know, he's a number one center in the NHL. Well, I think neither one of those things are going to end up being true. Um, I think he's a strong number two center. I think his the mercurial nature of his point production shows that in my view that it's it's largely driven by who he plays with that he's a really nice complimentary piece but not a driver and i would say if they really honestly thought he was in the nine million dollar range my guess is he's closer to seven five than he is nine yeah i was gonna ask you frank afp has him at seven years at 8.04 million um you don't think he's gonna get there he'll fall just shy of that you figure I mean, someone might step up and pay the extra bit to make sure they get him, but we're probably splitting hairs when I, I mean, that, that everything that I, I didn't know the number before you said it, but I said closer to seven, five than nine. Yeah. So 8.0 yeah. is right there. I mean, and I throw it at you just cause we, uh, we had great fun with that last week when talking about <laughs> Philip Ronick and yes. uh, the AFP number on Philip Ronick on a long-term deal is seven years at 8.36 million dollars so uh there you go um and we also uh, did this with nikita zadorov recently which brings us to our tim horton's poll question mm-hmm. frank if the canucks are going to pay pay market rate for one of their ufas who should it be bluger ronick joshua zadorov where are you casting your vote philip ronick and i don't even have to think about it I mean, before someone accuses me again of being his agent, I think Alan Walsh, uh, if he tweets enough, you, you certainly see that he does a good enough job doing that. I don't <laughs> I don't need to be anyone's agent and certainly not carrying anyone's water, just pointing out the realities of the marketplace. 
that include the arbitration case, which we talked about, that includes um, really like to me, all those other guys are replaceable. I love the step forward that Dakota Joshua has taken this year. I love the intelligence that Teddy Bluger has and how he's helped this team's penalty kill and their bottom six. All fine players. Um, Zadaroff, like I, I think he's a number four that I just wouldn't pay five million bucks a yeah. year for. Philip Ronick, like he's a half a point per game right shot defenseman who is the best fit that we've seen to this point in the Quinn Hughes experience in Vancouver. Why you'd want to try and go out and replace that when you already have something that works. To me, it's the devil you know. I, you probably don't love the idea that it could be at, you know, eight times eight, but the fact that that is, you know, what the market bears, like I, to me, I, I just wouldn't want to have to go out and find out the hard way what it's like to not have that. Well, yeah. especially with the scarcity of right shot defensemen on the free agent market. I mean, it's an exceedingly difficult. That makes position. my point for me yeah. because you go look at, at the penalty killers, go look at the third line centers, go look at the guys that bring some physicality and edge. My thought process when it comes to tweaking or working with the bottom six in your forward group is if you have strong culture and strong coaching, you should be able to develop those types of players and or sign them for closer to league minimum than, uh, you know, I don't know what the Dakota Joshua number is on AFP. My guess would be somewhere around 275. Three by uh, three, Frank. Three by okay, three. Okay, so perfect. Yeah. I, I, again, like the player, I'm not – I'm not getting myself in trouble on the cap signing him to three times three. Okay, but when how, you many, look how many players have the Canucks had over the last five seasons that they paid too much to pay play in their bottom six? Well, uh, tons. And the other thing is, if you're replacing Ronick, okay, so let's say you're on the free agent market replacing Ronick. AFP, AFP has Brandon Montour, who's 30, <laughs> incidentally, on a seven-year deal at 8.7. Million. So they have them as even more expensive than Philip Ronick for an older player. If in fact you figure, no, we can't pay Ronick or whatever reason we don't like Ronick, we're going to go try and replace him with a like player. Or you're on the trade market peddling, you know, some pretty significant assets to try and replace a, a top pair or a top four right shot defenseman. You didn't even bring up the other part of this with Philip Ronick, which is they're going to control the trade market if you decide to go that route this summer. Yeah. That's right. You are not, you're going to be getting 50 cents on the dollar of what you gave up to get him. So there's some sunk asset costs. Yeah. Throw that on top of all of it and then pay the next guy to come in and do what he's already doing. Do mm -hmm. not get yourself wrapped up if you're the Canucks in some kind of arbitrary, we can't pay this guy one penny more than Quinn Hughes just because we decide that we can't. When there again, I made this point a couple weeks ago. Yeah, last week we yeah. talked about all this, Frank. It was why I didn't, you know, uh, go, I know I didn't, I didn't want to go down. I didn't, I didn't want to go too deep. Down, <laughs> the point too is, deep down the rabbit hole again, but yeah, you you like it's an arbitrary rule. It's an RFA deal. It doesn't. They're not apples to apples. So stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pesci on the UFA market at six point seven. If you're interested in Carolina, at least that's what AFP says. Um. The playoffs moving up to Saturday, April 20th from Monday, April 22nd. And as J-Pad and Irf and everyone has uh, talked about this week, I'd be a hell of an ass for the Vancouver Canucks to play on the 20th, given that they're in Winnipeg on the evening of the 18th, would have to fly back two different time zones to host a game that night. But you tell me, would they ask the Canucks to play on that Saturday night, less than 48 hours after they finished the regular season? Being against tougher Winnipeg? for the Edmonton Oilers, they have back-to-backs yeah. on the 17th and 18th. I think it's Arizona, Colorado, to then come back and, and play uh, same time zones, but same thing. Um, look, I've seen crazier things happen, so I'm not going to say no. I don't know. I haven't asked any of the schedule makers or any anyone part of it, but it, it all depends, as you know. The reason why they're doing it on a Saturday is to get the marquee Saturday audience that instead of starting the playoffs on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, like they have the last, you know, as long as I can remember it, 
I've been saying forever, why not start on your best TV day of the week with the best action that everyone can, you know, dive into? There's going to have to be a late window somewhere, whether it's Van Edmonton, whoever it might be, they're going to want someone to be playing on Saturday, I'd assume. And I've seen quick turnarounds like this series go deep. You know, you go from a game seven to 48 hours later, you're playing game one of the next series. Sometimes that happens. Uh, I think less than ideal because especially with a slog in front of you, knowing that you could be playing for eight weeks of some of the most grueling hockey you have, I'd want to see them kind of go in fresh, but I'm not going to say it's out of the realm of possibility. Hey, is it possible? Cause all the Eastern teams play on Wednesday, the 17th, not the 18th. Is it possible? They just go with matinee in the early w- evening yeah. window on Maybe. Saturday and forget about the late Pacific window. I hate matinee games. First off, I hate, I especially hate matinee playoff games. Just makes it feel like less of an event to me. I don't know why that is. Uh, It's possible. And then you leave it to Sunday or Monday, but. uh, Well, yeah, because I I think you would have the Oilers and Canucks screaming bloody murder if they have to play that Saturday game. And the problem is, can you start Winnipeg at 9 p.m. local time? I'm not sure. Would they do that to the Jets? It's true, but then you got to look at, I guess, the broadcasters and their windows and yeah, what they well, having the NBA playoff believes. I believe that's in that. And of so course, you, so the, you're to your point, Frank, of, you might see an NBA or sorry, an NHL matinee game. And of course, uh, Winnipeg would have to have home ice in that scenario. Yeah. I guess you could car- start Colorado at 8 p.m. local time. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, what you're also dealing with is building availability too. Yeah, right. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on at one time. And, and by the way, er, you know, Irv had pointed that out um, about the, the playoffs opening on a Saturday. Uh, I did add not, not pertinent to Canucks fans, but May 6th or May 7th is what it looks like. The draft lottery is going to be yes. also related to TV windows. Frank, you don't know how much we would have wanted that information in nine of the last 10 years or eight <laughs> of the last nine years. Look, I, I do what I can, all right? Right. Um, there was uh, quite a debate on hockey Twitter this week, or maybe not a debate, maybe just quite a episode on hockey Twitter. You mean it, it, like threw someone in a casket and slammed the door? Is that what well, you're saying? yeah, it uh, it would appear so. Uh, Andrew Berkshire was trying to make a point and made it poorly and used Zach Hyman as an example of kids who come from means, kids who come from wealthy families having a leg up these days when you take a look at the cost of ice time, equipment, these personal coaches, summer hockey, and all the different things that goes into grooming a national hockey league players or, or, or at least the, you know, the thought process of what it takes to, to, to breed a, an NHL player these days. Uh, look, I don't want to get into the debate about Hyman and how hard he worked or anything like that, or how many teams his dad owned in the uh, GTHL uh, Toronto, Toronto minor hockey. What I do want to know is, is there any concern at the NHL level about the cost of financing youth hockey these days and whether or not, that could affect the player pool going forward. I do I do think that there is. Um I think that's the biggest barrier from the NHL and hockey going from a niche sport to being something bigger in the US. Um but what I will say having navigated the youth hockey and minor hockey waters in the US is it's shockingly affordable here. So I'll just give you an, and I don't know what it's like in Canada uh, or in your market, but I'll, I'll just tell you a quick story. Any player that's under the age of 10 can go on the flyers website and sign up for their learn to play program. And they will outfit you it from head to toe helmet to skates, including a stick with a bag and everything. And for free, and you will get 10 on ice sessions to see whether you like hockey or not. Wow. That that's every player in the entire area. That's there's fantastic. No yeah. There's no uh there's no salary requirement. It's it, anyone, no questions asked. You want to play hockey, you get a free starter set of of by the way, really good equipment and 10 on ice sessions. <laughs> the, the on ice sessions I think cost you a total of $150. But the equipment's free. And you get to keep the equipment? And equipment? you get to keep the equipment to start wow. off your hockey career. 
Terrific. I do believe the Vegas Golden Knights have done something along those lines as yeah, well. Yeah, how widespread is Almost Frank? every team in the U.S. Yeah. does it. This is uh, some of it's funded by the NHL and NHLPA uh, goals and dreams. Some of it's funded directly from the NHL. They have a, a fund that actually goes towards these programs. Some of it's funded by the teams themselves. So my point is, a people don't necessarily know about that, mm -hmm. and b. Every kid has the opportunity here, if you want to do it, to go do it. Mm -hmm. I think the big difference between where you are in the States, Frank, and, and where we are up here in Canada is ice time. Like you mentioned yeah. that a free 10 on ice sessions of ice time. Here you can't get it. Like I know for a fact that guys, when they come skate up here in the winters or sorry, in the summers when their seasons are over next to impossible for some of them to find ice time just to get out there on a sheet. So I think that that's one of the things that adds to it. That makes it so much more expensive. Wow. Plus also here, everyone, and to be completely fair, think there has that dream of their child making the NHL. That's it. You'd be giving away a lot of equipment uh, if you're, yeah. and, and Earth's, Earth's also right. One of the big differences between our countries the U.S. does athletic facilities in a major way. Uh, it does it way better than Canada. It seems like we scrape by in Canada. I was living in Toronto I, I at a time. There was not enough ice rinks in Toronto. You came out to Vancouver. It's now an issue. Um, ice sheets in terms of how few there are in the actual city. You disagree? I, I Yeah, I mean... I think there's still other significant barriers. It may be available, but our ice time is way more expensive. It's we're approaching 500 us dollars an hour. That's like seven, seven Canadian. Yeah, but at least you're, at least you're being able to pay for it. There aren't even times here where guys can go and get ice. Like I know Bedard couldn't get how on the you, ice. But how, who's affording $700 an hour Canadian. That's, that's the problem with it up in here in Canada. There's, there, yeah, there's so I, I think there are lots of, different things to break through, whether it's ice availability, whether it's uh, fees and participation, whether it's ice time, there, there's a long, long way to go to get there. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm, I'm always up for having the conversation. I guess my point is like the, the hymen part was ridiculous. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and as mentioned, I didn't want to go down that, uh, although it is um, quite odd that his father owned 90 youth hockey teams but guess uh, what also still owns them so if you thought like he did it just to, he had five kids one of them made the nhl and if you thought that it was some sort of play like i know the the junior team he bought he he saved it because it was folding and they've sent 80 kids to college on scholarships like yeah no it's, it's fantastic not a financial play to like better himself or give it you know it wasn't designed i don't think necessarily to give him and there's been plenty written about this like it's not like i guess the point that bothered me was that somehow this guy's a truther and he's out there revealing stuff that you know no one wants to talk about in the ugly there's been tons of stories written about this it's not what no one's pulling a wool over anyone's eyes here and no one's sitting here saying that this setup and system that we have is perfect mm. but once you get like let's assume that all those accusations are true do, do the toronto maple leafs do they just say hey zach come on come play with austin matthews because your daddy has money like that's not how it works no <laughs> no you've got to earn your way to the national hockey league that much uh, that much is clear no matter whether you got the head start of a family that could afford you all the different things that help on the journey to the national hockey mm -hmm. league um, we can all do a better job with that. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Um, Bob Murdoch, former National Hockey Leaguer, has passed away, and his family said it's because of he suffered from CTE. And, of course, this in the wake of Chris Simon's death and his family as well, saying that Chris really struggled in post-hockey life, and we'll find out if he had CTE as well. And Commissioner asked about this last week. Frank and still isn't convinced scientifically, despite the researchers at Boston University and elsewhere saying, no, this is uh, this is a thing now. Is it just going to take a change in leadership for the NHL to sort of recognize the truth on CT that in fairness, other leagues have gotten to prior to Gary and the NHL? The NFL has gotten there. The U.S. military has gotten there. The National Institute of Health. I mean, there's tons of. I think definitive studies that have linked repeated hits to the head and head trauma with CTE. 
Uh, I was the one who asked the question of the deputy commissioner because I don't think he's ever been asked. Um, and he's he was the one who said, um, Bill Daly, you know, no, and I think the science is lacking. I think the part that I struggle with is the litigation is over as far as I can tell. If there was a business reason or a legal reason, and these are two super intelligent legal minds in Gary Bettman and Bill Daly, if there was a reason to continue to deny, 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 I'd say, sure, like, you know, do do whatever it is that you need to, quote unquote, protect the shield. Um, that's what you're paid to do. But given that that suit has been settled and I'm not a legal expert, but my understanding that it was a class action suit and mm -hmm. whoever wanted to could have been party to it. And the terms of the settlement were accepted that no additional legal ramifications to my knowledge face the league. Then if that's the case, then it's, it seems like now is the proper time to acknowledge that that link does indeed exist. Um, I, I'll say on the other side of that, uh, separate and apart from it, Chris Simon had a lot of different things going on. Um, he had some family struggles. He had financial struggles. I believe he's one of the players that had his money swindled from him uh, from a financial advisor. Um, there's there's a lot. You know, I'm sure there was some some substance abuse or alcohol abuse that was part of that as well. And they his family came out and said we believe he has CTE, but I'm not saying he doesn't. Only not a, diagnosed yet. Yeah. Yeah. Only a brain bank can diagnose that That's because correct. it's not possible to be diagnosed in the living. So I think there's more to find out. I think it's a lot deeper than, and there's some societal issues at play, deeper than just saying because Chris Simon was an enforcer, because he had repeated hits to the head, that therefore mm -hmm. he has CTE. And even if he does, how do we know how that impacted his quality of life or not? There's still some parts of this that we still need to investigate and figure out. Um, that said, my overall opinion and feel on this is that we ask a lot of these players for our own entertainment value to do different things and put their bodies and their future lives on mm -hmm. the line. I just don't think we do enough, meaning the NHL, the NHLPA, the Alumni Association has taken huge strides. Glenn Healy has done amazing work helping yeah. hundreds of players behind the scenes that we'd have no idea about, but there's still way more to do. Mm. Indeed. Uh, Frank, we'll leave it there. Thank you for this. We'll catch up next week, sir. Enjoy your Easter weekend. Thanks guys. Have a good weekend. Hey everybody. If you're enjoying what you're seeing here, then follow along with Sakaris and Price on YouTube. I promise more content coming. They call it, the kids call it subscribe on YouTube. Well, how about liking it? Do that as well. Smash it right now.